Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 17th lecture of the course on sociological perspectives on modernity. Till now, we have covered uh, the modules on uh, thematic preliminaries, one, secondly, sociological modernity by Marx and Weber, thirdly, we have covered the structuralist interpretation of critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the works of through the contributions uh, made by uh, Claude uh, Levi Strauss and uh, Louis Althusser. Okay. And uh, the fourth module also we have covered, okay. uh, I mean western Marxist uh, per theoretical trajectory mm. uh, of critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the works of Georg Lukacs, um, Antonio Gramsci and Alan Turin. Okay. Now, we are going to uh, cover in these uh, in the 17th, 18th and 19th lecture perhaps, perhaps the 20th one also. I mean in these 3, 4 lectures we are going to look at a new module which is named as synthesizing modernity and social theory. How to bring about a synthesis between modernity and social theory? Okay. This is very important and who will be the key authors, key players in this, uh, in this module? One is Immanuel Wallerstein, secondly uh, Anthony Giddens, and thirdly, Eugen Habermas. Now, let us start with, let us discuss one by one. Okay. Let us start with Immanuel Wallerstein. Okay. If you, if you <coughs> look at the, the slides, okay, you will find that, uh, that uh, Wallerstein okay, uh, is an American sociologist, historical scientist, and world systems analyst. Let me let me give you a brief prefatory remark about about Wallerstein. Okay, Wallerstein has been working on anti-mainstream development trajectory. Wallerstein has been working on anti-militarized development trajectory. Okay, Wallerstein has been working on anti-globalization development trajectory. Wallerstein has been working on anti-nuclear weapon development trajectory. Broadly, he has been looking at, at the, the ways in which different development narratives can be sketched in, in the context of India as well as Africa. That is very important, because when we look at alternative modernities, multiple modernities, we must go beyond European, American, uh, European and American development narratives. We must look at the development narratives which emanated, uh, which which emerged, or which are going to emerge, okay, in the context of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Okay, we have to go beyond the singular view of development in modernity, science, and so on propagated by the United States of America and Europe. Okay. In this context, okay, Wallerstein, Giddens, Habermas, they are very important, how they try to look at this, these uh, configurations, how they try to uh, reconfigure 
the development narratives in the context of non-European, non-American societies. Prima facie, Wallerstein became interested in world affairs as a teenager in New York City and was particularly interested in the anti-colonial movements in India at that time. It is very important. See, Wallerstein was also a product of the horrendous crimes and casualties perpetrated by the Second World War, okay, one. And secondly, the kind of anti-colonial movements which, which were going on, uh, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist movements which were going on in the context of India, in the context of Cuba, in the context of uh, Venezuela, Vietnam, uh, even, even People's Republic of China and, and Japan. Okay. And he was very much interested in, 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 in such anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist movements. He started his career as an expert on post-colonial African affairs, which he selected as the focus of his studies after an international youth conference in 1959. And let me tell you, 1959 also is, is the year in which uh, Cuba became uh, politically independent. Okay? Socialism emerged in Cuba. Okay? And 59, that is why 1959 is very important. Okay. As 1947 is very important in the context of India's development paradigms, India's uh, narratives on modernity. Okay. Uh, 1959 equally is important so far as Latin American uh, uh, narratives on development are concerned. Okay. Emmanuel Wallerstein's publications were almost exclusively devoted till this to till today until the early 1970s when he when he uh, i mean uh, i mean his his publications his engagement with his intellectual uh, and political engagement with with uh, such themes i mean anti colonial movements in india post colonial african affairs and so on till the 1970s when he began to distinguish himself as a historian and theorist of the global capitalist economy on a macroscopic level. His, his Wallerstein's early criticism of global capitalism and championship of anti-systemic movements have recently made him a great eminence with the anti-globalization movement within and outside the academic community along with uh, stalwarts. Uh, such as Noam Chomsky as well as Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu has passed away, I mean he passed away in 2002 or 3, uh, I think 2003 or 2 uh, uh, and, and Noam Chomsky is still alive. Okay? Um, and these three, okay, they, they tried to posit, they tried to situate the debate on modernity. Okay? against the backdrop of anti-globalization movements. What is globalization? Wallerstein said globalization is nothing but, but the way different economies are integrated into a single unified whole. Okay? I mean economic integration. Now, people talk about cultural integration, people talk about political integration, of course, they are very important. Okay? But Wallerstein Prime FSC, he, he emphasized on economic integration. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you look at um, globalization, okay, how culturally um, it integrates, I mean the way our food pattern has changed, okay. political integration, there, there are different dimensions. Okay. Bourdieu also is very important, uh, Chomsky is very important. I mean the way today Chomsky has foregrounded the, the problematic of, of liberalization, privatization and globalization and, and, the, and the urgent need for social and political movements against, against 
liberalization, privatization, and globalization. I think I think uh, these are extremely important dimensions to be studied, okay, in the context of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Because liberalization, privatization, and globalization, they were they have been considered the paradigms of development, especially in the context of 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 uh, uh, the way India countries like India adopted the new economic policy in 1991 and uh, one must understand that what may be the possible alternatives to these, these mainstream development narratives, what may be the possible alternatives to such state led development paradigms. Okay? These are very important uh, dimensions uh, that we must discuss. That is why, that is why uh, when, uh, when we discuss um, Wallerstein's contributions to the debates on critical modernist paradigm in sociology, we must understand the, the background, we must understand the, the context in which Wallerstein was working, has been working. Okay? Wallerstein was influenced by anti colonial movements anti imperialist movements okay in india as well as africa okay uh, wallerstein was also very much interested what kind of development paradigms okay what kind of development narratives were sketched okay in the post colonial uh, african affairs in the context of post uh, colonial uh, asian affairs okay what kind of mode of production, what kind of uh, development narratives uh, the state of India has, has promoted over a long period of 70 years, I mean 70 years, even after 70 years of independence, what are the state led development paradigms and what may be the possible alternatives to such state led development paradigms. Okay. That is why Wallerstein's early criticism of global capitalism okay, must be understood in this context, must be understood in the context of anti colonial movements, anti imperialist movements in India as well as Africa, also Latin America. Uh, Wallerstein's early criticism of global capitalism okay, or, or his, his perspectives on or, or his standpoint on, on anti-systemic movements, anti-state movements, they must be understood, they must be examined against the backdrop of the, the kind of insecurity, economic, political, social, cultural, military and so on okay, uh, has been created the kind of insecurity which has been created uh, in the context of uh, the imposition of Americanized and Europeanized hegemonic globalization on the rest of the population. Okay. We must understand this and Wallerstein's early criticism of global capitalism and subsequently his, his, his critique towards uh, globalization must be understood in this context. In fact, the way we understand globalization, globalization is, is, uh, is a process within capitalist mode of production. This is okay. Wallerstein's most important work, I mean the modern world system okay, appeared in three volumes in the I mean three volumes one in 1974, second the second one uh, was published in 1980 and the third one was published in 1989. In the modern world system, Wallerstein draws on three intellectual influences. Okay. Then what are those three intellectual influences? First, it was Marx. The Wallerstein, as I said, Wallerstein was influenced by three major theoretical trajectories. 
okay, intellectual trajectories. First one was from Marx, was by Marx, he was immensely influenced by Marx. Marx, whom Wallerstein follows in emphasizing underlying economic factors and their dominance over ideological factors in global politics and whose economic thinking he has adopted with such ideas um, as the dichotomy between labor and capital. Um, we have discussed uh, uh, Marx's views on, on capitalism, modernity, science and so on, that, that ideology and so on, that the, the dichotomy between labor and capital, the staged view of world economic development through uh, such as uh, feudalism and capitalism, belief in the accumulation of capital and dialectic and, and much more. To, to tell you very briefly, okay, we, have, we have discussed these, these such dichotomies between labor and capital, um, uh, their, their uh, labor and capital, their factors of production okay, uh, in, in, uh, in the works of Marx, we have discussed how capital it is the inherent uh, characteristic of capital to displace labor from its place. It, it, it is the inherent characteristic of capital to displace labor and labor in turn tries to uh, keep its place in the in uh, to alongside capital for its survival. It is very important. Okay, there, there are two factors of production, labor uh, creates wages, capital creates interest and so on, but, but Marx said, uh, in fact Wallerstein also adopted this view that uh, which factor of production creates capital? It is only labor which creates capital, but ultimately capital is labor displacing. And, and we have we have discussed these things, uh, 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 such such dichotomy between labor and capital, through uh, the staged view of world economic development, starting from hunting and gathering economy, uh, the slave society, the feudal society, and the capitalist society. When capital is labor displacing, then capital gets accumulated. Labor gets displaced. Labor. Uh, disappears, labor is pushed to the periphery and capital dominates. That, that, that the world economic uh, uh, development, the way it has propounded uh, or the way it has carried forward the dominance of capital over labor okay, must be challenged, must be interrogated, must be questioned. World economic development historically has believed in the unfettered accumulation of capital by displacing labor and, and uh, also the principles of dialectic uh, as we have already discussed in the context of Marx that there are three principles of dialectic the I mean namely the interpenetration of the opposites, secondly quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and thirdly uh, the law of negation of negation. Okay. I need not uh, discuss uh, again, uh, these things again and again, okay. but I, I hope in the, in the initial lectures while discussing Marx's contributions to critical modernist paradigm in sociology, we have discussed. This is the first intellectual influence or, or uh, putting it succinctly uh, that uh, this uh, uh, Wallerstein's works, Wallerstein's contributions to uh, the synthesis of modernity uh, and social theory has been intellectually uh, influenced prima facie by Karl Marx. Okay. Secondly, the dependency theory. Dependency theory we have not yet discussed in detail. Let me tell you very quickly what is dependency theory. Most obviously, it is concepts of core and periphery. When I say core, it represents the developed countries the metropolis and the periphery represents the underdeveloped countries or developing countries or the satellites. If core, if developed countries are known as metropolis, then underdeveloped countries or developing countries are known as 
mm, satellites. Okay. It was propagated by it, uh, initially by Andre Gunder Frank in the context of Latin American model of development. Okay. What is this dependency theory? Okay. The proponents of depend dependency theory including Frank suggest that the raw materials from the underdeveloped countries or developing countries or colonized nations are in general transferred from I mean I mean the raw materials in general are transferred from the underdeveloped countries to developed countries and in turn what underdeveloped countries in, such as India receive we receive the finished products thereby we do not evolve our own technology to to come up with to come out with finished goods okay i mean there is always a one way interaction between the developed countries and developing developing countries or de underdeveloped countries they only supply raw material cheap labor force to the developed countries and the way developed countries they supply the finished goods finished products at a much higher price to the underdeveloped countries or developing countries okay thereby underdeveloped countries or develop uh, um, developing countries okay they become perennially dependent on the developed you you know this such examples the way during the colonial period india supplied raw materials and cheap labor force to the great britain to great britain and uh, in turn great britain used to supply the finished goods i mean cotton especially to india okay thereby india did not or could not rather as a colonized nation india could not evolve its own technology to to come up with finished goods i mean in the in this case it is cotton okay then first intellectual influence by marx second intellectual influence by the proponents of dependency theory including andre gunder frank and thirdly french historian fernand brodeur who had described the development and political implications of existence networks of economic exchange in the European world between 1400 and 1800. These are very important uh, documents. They will also tell you many, many, many things about the development narratives of colonialism, colonialist or imperialist development narratives. Why 1400 to 1800? Let me give you a few examples. In 1492, Columbus discovered America. In 1498, Vasco da Gama discovered India. Okay? Whether they were discoveries or not, they also should be interrogated. Such such statements must be questioned. Okay? Perhaps these these. Uh, continents were were discovered by by uh, an improved mode of production namely europe european mode of production just to plunder just to loot these nations for for centuries okay again in the 18th century, why why these are important in 1750s, 60s, we have seen industrial revolution in Europe. Okay. I mean, these are the, the economic exchanges. Okay. And in France, we saw the French Revolution in 1789. That is why French historian, I mean, Fernand Brodel is very important, who had described the development and political implications of existence networks of economic exchange in the European world between 1400 and 1800. These are very important. Okay. We can also discuss if, if some certain things come up, then we can also discuss what happened in 1500 to 1600, 1600 to 1700 and so on. Okay. I mean all European expansion in the rest of the world, though we say that uh, and, and Europe became, uh, I mean uh, Europeans became especially the British 
the Turks, the, the Portuguese, the French, okay, they became excellent merchants worldwide and through their business, through their trade, through their commerce, they tried to colonize all other nations including India. Okay. That is why when I said the in uh, Wallerstein's uh, reflections on the modern world system okay, drawn three major intellectual influences. One was by Marx, secondly uh, André Gunder Frank, I mean the proponents of uh, dependency theory including Frank. And thirdly, Fernand Broder. Then, what follows from this? And presumably, the practical exper uh, the practical experience and and impressions gained from Wallerstein's work regarding post-colonial Africa. Wallerstein has also stated that a major influence on his work was the World Revolution of 1968. World Revolution, when I said. I mean, uh, it was a, a revolution, especially carried out by the students in in several universities in France. Wallerstein, Giddens, Habermas, they all joined that struggle, that movement, movement to to have free speech, expression, free expression. I I I, I must be, uh, I must have freedom to uh, express my opinion. Okay which was curtailed at that time in, 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 in major European countries, including France okay, and students took the lead. Okay. Universities must be the sites, universities must provide the space for freedom of expression, freedom to dissent, freedom of speech. And Wallerstein at that time was on the faculty of Columbia University at the time of student uprising students movements there and participated in a faculty committee that attempted to resolve the dispute, the dispute between the university and, and the students. And, and indeed, Wallerstein has argued in several works that, that this such revolution by, led by students okay, uh, in 1968 in France marked the end of liberal thought, liberalism okay, as a viable ideology in the modern world system that anything goes will not work. Okay. Why, why uh, I am trying to bring about a critique to liberalism or I am trying to uh, reflect on Wallerstein's critique to uh, liberalism. I mean uh, we always suggest that uh, we must have liberal thought there must be liberty, we must entertain liberal views, obviously we should do that. But one interesting argument that, that, that is of often that we often make that, um, that in such development narratives mostly or in, in such narratives about modernity, okay, mostly the indigenous people, the indigenous knowledge systems, they disappear very quickly. In this sense, such development narratives, such state-led development narratives have made a mockery of liberty in any substantial sense. Then there is no freedom. We want to build dams, we want to build uh, big projects, we want to build uh, huge projects which will displace labor, uh, uh, which will displace the indigenous population, okay, which will uh, help in the disappearance of indigenous knowledge systems, traditional knowledge system. Then where does the, the aspect of freedom of such indigenous people, indigenous knowledge systems lie? No. If it disappears, if, if indigenous people, indigenous knowledge systems, they tend to disappear in such state-led development narratives, okay, then uh, I must say that, that um, such development narratives have made a mockery of liberty in any substantial sense. In this sense, in this sense, Wallerstein has argued in several works that, that, that this revolution, such revolution in, in France in 1968 led by students marked the end of such, such 
state led development paradigms which have made a mockery of liberty okay, in any substantial sense, which marked the end of liberalism as a viable ideology in the modern world system. Okay. One aspect of, of, his, of, of his work that Wallerstein certainly deserves credit for uh, is his anticipating the growing importance of, of the north south conflict at a time when the main world conflict was the cold war. I hope all of you were aware of the cold war, cold war I mean when two ideologies were at conflict with each other, one was promoted by the United States of America I mean capitalism and one was promoted by the, the erstwhile uh, Soviet Union uh, I mean that is socialism. When the cold war was at the peak, Wallerstein anticipated that this cold war is not going to survive for long. Okay. Even if both capitalism and socialism were at the loggerheads at that time and they were very established powerhouses. And we all know how Soviet Union also made tremendous strides in science, in military research, in nuclear research, um, in, in uh, other so called development parameters. Of course, uh, USSR has also done massive strides in the case of health, education, social security measures and so on, okay. but it also has created its own powerhouse. It created at that time. Okay. Now, there is no longer, I mean, there is no Soviet Union. And such was the situation which was termed as Cold War, but Wallerstein at that time very astutely anticipated, not uh, anticipated that, that this Cold War is not going to survive for a long period of time in the 70s and so on, 60s and 70s. He was referring to only the North and South conflict. When I say North South conflict, I mean North again is represented by, by the developed countries and South is represented by the developing or underdeveloped countries. There will always be a conflict between the developed countries as well uh, on the one hand and developing or underdeveloped countries on the other. And, and in this sense, Wallerstein rejects the notion of this third world that people very often why, why we use the third world countries or so. I mean third world when we say it represents uh, the underdeveloped countries, first world capitalist developed countries. I mean capitalist countries and second world often refers to uh, the socialist countries and the third world refers to underdeveloped countries including India. As he was, as Wallerstein was very much engaged in uh, studying uh, the conflicts between northern hemisphere on the one hand and southern hemisphere on the other. Okay. He rejects the notion of, of a third world uh, by claiming that there is only one world connected by a complex network of economic exchange relationships. That is a world economy or world system in which the dichotomy between capital and labor and the endless accumulation of capital by competing agents uh, account for frictions and this approach is known as the world systems theory. That, that there is there will be only one world which will be connected by a complex network of economic exchange relationships. What do we mean by a complex network of economic exchange relationships? Okay. Number one, we have already discussed dichotomy between capital and labor, how capital is labor displacing, how capital displaces labor okay. and the endless accumulation of capital by uh, that is what we have, we have uh, seen in the context of uh, the way world economic development has uh, historically taken place. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean the accumulation of endless accumulation of capital by the owners of the means of production, whatever stage of society that you witness, in this case it is capitalism. Okay. And, and, and this particularly this one world, which is connected by a complex network of economic exchange relationships, okay, that is a world economy or, or a world system, okay, in which the dichotomy between capital and labor 
and the endless accumulation the never ending the incessant uh, accumulation of capital by by displacing labor from the purview of the process of production by competing agents account for frictions there there will be there they will always be on the logarithms both labor as well as capital okay this approach is known as the the world systems theory wallerstein locates the origin of the modern world system in the 16th century western europe and the americas and initially uh, slight uh, and initially only slight advance in capital accumulation in britain the dutch republic and france due to specific political circumstances at the end of the period of feudalism set in motion a process of gradual expansion as a result as a consequence of which only one global network or system of economic exchange exists today by the 19th century virtually every area on earth was incorporated into the capitalist world by by the by the 19th century uh europe dominated the entire world today especially after the second world war after the the horrendous crimes and cas casualties which we have seen in the context of hiroshima and nagasaki during the second world war by the united states of america okay now the american dominance american hegemony uh, has has taken over such european dominance okay that's why uh, i just said that by the 19th century virtually every area on earth was incorporated into the capitalist world economy whether it was by europe or by us today whether it was um, uh, hegemonized by europe then and us now the capitalist world system nevertheless is is far from homogeneous in cultural political and economic terms it is pretty heterogeneous heterogeneous to suit its own need if it will be homogeneous then it will not be able to survive it has to be heterogeneous okay that's why wallerstein argues that that the capitalist world system is however far from homogeneous in cultural political and economic terms instead the capitalist world system is characterized by fundamental differences in civilizational development accumulation of political power and capital if you look at the way capitalist world system operates in the context of europe or us their civilizational development their accumulation of political power and capital obviously are different contrary to affirmative theories of modernization and capitalism wallerstein does not conceive of these differences as mere residues or irregularities that can and will be overcome as the system as a whole evolves let me let me give you a brief example of this what is a modern what is modernization theory or what is capitalist theory okay Cap i mean modernization theory is in fact are the theories of capitalism okay modernization theory suggests that the underdeveloped economies the developing economies will make progress if they follow the pattern of the uh, whether if they follow the pattern of development of developed countries already developed countries then in order to make development possible developing countries such as india underdeveloped countries such as india must follow the pattern of development of the already developed countries maybe great britain or us but wallerstein was absolutely against this that india need not or africa need not or latin america need not follow the development pattern of the already developed ones because even us and europe they 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 have their own different they have their uh, uh, unique distinct civilizational development paradigms patterns accumulate fundament there are fundamental differences in accumulation of power and capital in both continents similarly 
India will have a different development paradigm, India will have a different paradigm of, on, of modernity. Okay. That is why Wallerstein was very much critical about, about the theories of modernization and, and theories of capitalism. Wallerstein does not conceive of these such, such differences as mere residues or irregularities that can and will be overcome as the system as a whole evolves. Much more uh, a lasting division of the world in core semi periphery and and periphery is an inherent feature of of the of the modern world system now in the independency theory we we had discussed the distinction between core and periphery um, and and uh, now we are discussing uh, core semi periphery and periphery it is interesting to see. Now, areas which have so far remained outside the reach of the world system enter it at the stage of periphery. There is a fundamental and institutionalized, institutionally stabilized division of labor between core and periphery. While the core has a high level of technological development, I mean the developed countries, the metropolis, okay. While the core has, has a high level of technological uh, development and manufactures complex products, the role of the periphery is to supply raw materials, agricultural products and cheap labor uh, for the expanding uh, agents of the developed countries or the core. Okay? Economic exchange between core and periphery, okay? economic exchange between core and periphery takes place on unequal terms. Okay. That is what the, the proponents of dependence theory also suggest, right? including Andre Gunder Frank. The periphery is forced to sell its products at low prices, but has to buy the core of the products, the finished goods uh, of the core of the developed countries at a relatively high prices, at a comparatively high price. This unequal state which once established tends to stabilize itself due to inherent semi-deterministic constraints, quasi-deterministic constraints. And, and, and the, the statuses of, of both core as well as periphery are not mutually exclusive and fixed to certain geographic areas. Instead, they are relative to each other and, and continues to shift. They, they are pretty dynamic. Okay. There is a zone called semi-periphery, which acts as a periphery to the core and a core to the periphery. At the end of the 20th century, this, this zone would comprise namely Eastern Europe, China, Brazil or Mexico. Okay. Peripheral and core zones can also coexist very closely in the same geographic area. Okay. Let me give you a uh, 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 quick, uh, quickly an example of this, um, how this concept of uh, semi-periphery has come up. Suppose India is, is, a, is a part of periphery so far as United States of America is concerned, but India becomes a core so far as Ghana is concerned, Sudan is concerned. I mean India's investment in, in uh, Sudanese oil, okay. that is also an interesting case, case in point. If you, if you want to read critical geographies of power, I mean India's role in Africa and so on. Okay. India also bec has become a core to, to uh, many, many, many African uh, nations. Okay. But India becomes a periphery when it comes to European Union or, or the United States of America. Okay. One, one effect of, of such expansion uh, of the world system is the continuing commodification of things including human labor. Okay. Our labor also when, when capital is labor displacing, capital also tries to attempt to commodify human labor, human self, human agency, human I mean that individual gets commodified. The individual is reduced to a machine, the individual is reduced to a commodity which can be bought and sold in the market. Okay. 
natural resources, land, labor and human relationships are gradually being stripped of their intrinsic value and turned into commodities in a market which dictates their exchange value. Okay? That is why I, I gave you the example of, of indigenous people, indigenous knowledge systems and so on. Even, even you can you can commodification of human labor when you look at you can look at uh, uh, the um, uh, the disciplines I mean sub disciplines within sociology you may look at sociology of science sociology of gender caste race studies uh, and so on uh, even even industrial sociology industrial relations uh, in contemporary capitalist phase okay it's very important in the in the last two decades. I mean since 1990s or three decades, okay. Wallerstein has increasingly focused on uh, the intellectual foundations of the modern world system. The structures of knowledge defined by the disciplinary division between sociology, anthropology, political science, economics and the humanities and the pursuit of universal theories of human behavior. Wallerstein regards the structures of knowledge as Eurocentric in, in bringing about a critique to such Eurocentric uh, knowledge, Wallerstein has been highly influenced by the new sciences of theorists like uh, uh, Prigop. Okay. Wallerstein has also argued consistently since 1980 uh, when the second volume of the modern world system was published that the United States is a hegemon in decline. He was often mocked for, uh, for making this claim during the 1990s when, when uh, uh, after, uh, after the uh, debacle of socialism in the erstwhile USSR. But since Iraq war, this argument has become more widespread. He has also consistently argued that the modern world system has reached an its end point. He believes that the next 50 years will be a period of chaotic uh, instability which will result in a new system one which may be more or less egalitarian than than the present one okay then what we have discussed discussed uh, quickly okay uh, i have discussed uh, i mean we have discussed uh, when i said uh, structures of knowledge are eurocentric in nature or americanized in nature okay then then wallerstein was trying to interrogate the singular view of, of knowledge, of modernity, of science, of development and so on. Okay? That is why our, our development trajectory must, must go beyond such Eurocentric structures of knowledge or Americanized hegemonic structures of knowledge. Okay? That is why through the, the modern world system, okay, Wallerstein believes that, that the next 50 years or so will be a period of chaotic instability. You also now we also see okay, in the entire world there is, there is instability. You look at Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, any, any, anywhere uh, Europe and so on, okay, there, there is instability. Even capitalism is, is struggling to strive, survive. Okay. And, and the way Wallerstein anticipates that such, such instability, such, such in, inherent contradictions of capitalism will, will certainly result in a, in a new system, one which may be more or less egalitarian than, than the present capitalist mode of production. Okay. In this lecture, we have, we have discussed um, we have started this module on, on synthesizing modernity and social theory okay? uh, through the contributions of Immanuel Wallerstein, Anthony Giddens and Jürgen Habermas. We have, we have discussed how Wallerstein's works have, be, have, have been influenced by Marx, Frank and, and Brodel uh, and, and his reflections on, on the modern world system, world systems theory as a whole. And uh, in, the, in the coming lecture, uh, two to three lectures, what we are going to do, we are going to specifically discuss uh, 
Wallerstein's reflections on capitalist uh, world system, core periphery distinction, semi periphery, okay, and and the way he looked at uh, the modernity of technology and the modernity of uh, liberation. I mean, I mean, what is an eternal modernity uh, and what is a fleeting modernity? Okay, what is eternal modernity? What is fleeting modernity? And so on. Okay, and then we'll we'll. Uh, go on to uh, 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 Anthony Giddens. Okay, thank you.